Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everyone. I'm Emily. Uh, my sobriety date is November 1st, 2004. My home group is the underground group of Alcoholics Anonymous. We meet Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, 8 o'clock, 4th and Lombard, Center City, Philadelphia. Um, I'm, uh, I'm really happy to be here. I did dress up for you guys, but it's freezing outside, so I have to wear this Italian jacket. I'm not Italian, um, but uh, I'm wearing this jacket. Uh, so, let's see. I don't know what I'm going to say, you guys. Um, I am really happy to be here. I came with, with my posse from Philly. They were the ones, yeah, they were the ones singing. If you heard them singing, there's is Linda Ronstadt, I think. Um, so, that was them. And, uh, yeah, no, we have a good time, man. We had a good time coming up. We're going to have a great time going home. And I just, I love them. And they've been there for me. And, um, I don't know, it's really awesome. Uh, I don't know. Let's see. So, usually when I tell my story like this, I, I'm very much the type of alcoholic nowadays that has this huge ego, right? So, I've heard a lot of really great speakers. And, um, I mean, uh, last weekend we had um, the the Pennsylvania Young People's Conference, and there were these amazing speakers from all over the country. And, uh, I mean, people were crying. People were laughing. It was like that sort of, like, you know, tent revival type AA. And, um and, uh, I mean, everybody's digging it. And, I mean, it was just such a great experience. And, you know, with speakers like that, and I've heard so many of them, it's just like, yeah, people are laughing and crying and all this stuff. So, like, you know, when I think about when I tell my story, I'm just like, oh, man, you know. Like, I want people passing tissue boxes, you know, because they're just crying from my story. It's just so moving, you know. And, uh, and like, people laughing really hard. They're just holding each other and hugging and just <laughs> celebrating, you know. And um, and then before I even get to finish my story, everybody carries me out on their shoulders, and um, and and there's a parade, and uh, and it's just it's a magical scene for everyone, and um, and that's just you know that's the way my ear works. So and I used to get really nervous because I took that thought really seriously, and I would just I would want to throw up because I'm like my story is so boring. It's so boring. Like I drank alone. I drank a lot of vodka, and. I didn't do anything. Like, I went out maybe five times, you know. Like, as soon as I realized what alcohol could do for me, people just very quickly realized that I was not sort of fun drunk to be around, you know. Um, I was the one that people had to take care of before we even got anywhere, you know. Um, And I don't know, I didn't learn that from anywhere. Like, I didn't think consciously, like, oh, I'm going to be that girl that everybody has to take care of. I just, that's just the way that I drank, you know. Um, so it just became easier to drink by myself because then nobody got in the way and then I didn't feel bad and, um, and all that. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I'm feeling pretty, pretty stoked to be at a meeting. Um, and it's beautiful here and there's so many. There's like the, the lawn seats over there, which is really cool. Hi. Um, no, this is awesome. And one of my favorite sounds in the world is, uh, is the sound of crickets. So that's really nice. Um, crickets and rain. Just a little side note. Um, <laughs> there's nothing to do with my alcoholism. Um, <laughs> sorry. Sorry, Dave. He asked me. You can blame him. Whatever comes out the rest of the, the hour. Um, I don't know. This is so – I was actually feeling a little bit off my square today. I haven't been to a meeting in about a week, and that's unusual. Um, and I really – I very much – like to keep it very regular because I find that that's just kind of what works for me. And, um, the reason for that, I was, I was in North Carolina. My grandmother died last, uh, Sunday. And, um, you know, I was down there all week being with my family and, uh, and driving and, and doing all that stuff. Um, I got to tell you guys, uh, you know, we're a very close family. It wasn't like, you know, somebody that I don't really know that well died. It was, it was a big impact. And, um, I was taken care of the entire time, you know, which made it possible for me to show up and take care of my family when they needed it. Um, and that was an absolute miracle. And, and just the fact that my eyes were open enough to see that was a miracle in and of itself, you know. Um, 
I got the call 2 a.m. from my, well, I got a message around 2 a.m. and I called my mom and she told me what was going on. And uh, that was in the middle of the, the Pensy Pasta, so I went and I, I took the speaker the next day to the airport and I was driving home and I was like, I gotta go down there, you know, because I found out she was in the hospital and, you know, it was a very emotional conversation with my mom and, um, you know, so I, I went down there and it was so, it was so easy. You know, and my friends made it easy, and God made it easy. I had this whole weekend of this amazing AA experience to just absolutely pump me full of excitement and love, and then to go down to North Carolina and share that with them was just like unbelievable, you know. And uh, and to to have the means to go down there and the flexibility, of my job. I mean, just all this stuff was hitting me all at once. How lucky and grateful and blessed I was, you know. Um, so I got to go down there and. And just be with my family and, and be present. And that's a big deal for an alcoholic like me. Like, when I got here, my heart was so closed off to everything and everybody, you know, including my family. I did not feel any sort of form of compassion or really, I mean, I have to say love. And that's not like a judgment or an exaggeration. I didn't know how to feel it, how to express it. Um, you know, I was, I was two years sober when I described this feeling to my sponsor and she said, Emily, that's called compassion. Have you never felt that before? And I said, no, you know, that's the kind of alcoholic that that's two years sober, you know? Um, so I got to go down there and I got to know what compassion feels like. I got to know what empathy feels like. I got to, you know, be there for my mom because her mom, you know, she was there with her and, you know. It was just amazing. And, you know, Megan took care of my house and my cat, puss, and, uh, you know, and, and it was cool because that's, so at Pensy Pa, when you introduce yourself at Pensy Pa, you say, hi, I'm Emily, I'm an alcoholic. And instead of just the hi, Emily, um, they say, hi, Emily, we love you, Emily, lots and lots and lots and whole bunches. And at first it's really weird, and I didn't do it at first because I was like, oh, my God, they're chanting, and um, there's a lot of chanting, I don't like that. And and then I got into it, and by the end I was screaming it, you know. And uh, like it always happens like that, you know. And you know, I remember I would be down there with my family. We'd just be sitting around and you know talking about what to do with my grandmother's ashes, and you know these really serious conversations. And they would come to an end, and we'd just be hanging out. And then all of a sudden, just out of nowhere, I'd be like, "I love you, mom. Lots and lots and lots, and a whole bunch of you know." And they were like, "Oh, they didn't really know what to do with me because <laughs> they were just like, oh, that's special, Emily's." great um you know and they would just sit there nobody really said it back and or it was like oh love you too em you know and um you know and what's funny is as soon as i got back i got all these messages from my family like on facebook and like calls and text messages and they all said i love you emily lots and lots and lots and whole bunches you know so it was just it was really cool to kind of uh to be a part of that you know um because again i'm not wired naturally to be like that um i'm wired to to think about you in relation to me, and that's it, you know? I'm, I'm wired to think about how can I feel better? How can I feel good, you know? Had that had this happened a few years ago, it would have been my grandma. I'm really upset, you know? And instead it was like, Mom, what can I do for you? You know, or my aunt, what can I do for you? And, um, and I got to grieve and, and do all that and be completely present. So that was amazing, and that's, that's what AA gives me today, you know? Um, and now I'm here with you guys. Um, so let's see. Uh, I speak till nine, right? Um, done. Um, no, so let's see. So I, I really believe that I was an alcoholic, uh, you know, pretty early on, you know, when I was in fifth or fifth grade. And when I was five in, in kindergarten, I'm pretty sure I could use a drink. Um, you know, I remember being in church and, you know, and so in Lutheran services, they had the children's sermon. And my dad would take me every once in a while and the, the preacher Lutheran guy, <laughs> don't go anymore, uh, would call the kids up, and um, and my dad would always nudge me to go up with all the other little kids, like a normal little kid, just go up with all the little kids, and you go to Sunday school, and you eat snacks, and you drink juice, and you hang out, and I didn't want to hang out with the other little kids, I was terrified, absolutely terrified, I hated the kids my age, I always ended up hanging out with their parents at sleepovers, you know, I was that kid, and um, like just total dork, and so they would call the kids, and I would be drawing and not paying attention to what's going on. And, uh, you know, I would literally grip the seat during the children's sermon because I was not getting up there in front of other people, you know. So at a really young age, 
I, I was terrified. I, I didn't know what of. I couldn't have said, like, oh, the reason I would last like to go up to the children's sermon today is because I am afraid of what people will think of me, you know? I would just knew that I was gripped in terror, and I didn't know why, and, and I had this constant anxiety, um, you know, just, just with everyone. You people were terrifying to me, you know? Um, so... I'm living, I'm living my life like that at a, at a little age. And I like to play by myself. You know, my punishment when I was growing up was to go outside. That was like my grounding. You know, I like, go play with the other little kids. No, you know, <laughs> don't make me do it. I hated those little kids, you know, and they were great. They were adorable, but I couldn't stand it. I hated it. And, um, you know, cause there's this disconnect, there was just this disconnect and this fear and, and all that, you know, and, um, what I became obsessed with growing up was how do I fix that? How do I fix this feeling? You know, and it, and it didn't have a whole lot to do with you or with alcohol or with me. It was just like, I just need to feel better. I just need to feel better, you know. And um, so that became an obsession really early on. How do I feel better? You know, because and I wasn't drinking at five. There was something wrong with me in sobriety, you know. Um, so let's see. Uh, what happened? Oh, I drank. I drank at 15. I drank at 15, and um, I waited that long. I had a couple of, of people in my family that were pretty bad alcoholics, and I got to see firsthand what that does to families. Um, and if you know about that, then I don't need to really get into it. Um, but it's, it's bad, and it's lonely, and there's a lot of hurt physically and, you know, mentally and, and all that stuff. And, um... You know, I was right there in the middle of it as a kid, and and alcohol was not attractive to me. I saw what it did. Why would I drink? You know, so when my friends started experimenting in like middle school and early high school, I wanted nothing to do with it. I know what I know what alcohol is, so I'm, I'm above that. And I also saw in their class, uh, you know, that it was bad, and I would be shooting heroin in my eyeball, and I wasn't gonna drink. You know, I wasn't gonna smoke pot. I was gonna, I'm on the honor roll, and there, you know, and um. You know, I was also pretty convinced that I was a genius, so I had to do good in school. That was one of the things that I used to explain why I felt different from everyone else. I literally would sit, I didn't need TV, I would sit in the, in the hallway and look up at the ceiling and, just, ceiling and just think, what's wrong with me? And then it would just go. And one of them was, um, was that I was a genius, and that's why nobody got me, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and, and I knew there were kids smarter than me because I'm so average, so, you know, it's hard to convince yourself of a lie, so then you got to, like, sort of come around that. And so I was, like, creatively more genius than them. And, like, that's not real genius. And they just study, you know? I don't need that. So, um, yeah, so that was one of the things. But uh, at 15, I drank. And, and I don't know why, because I had been so against it for so long. And then um, a bunch of girls on the team that I was on, they were, you know, we were just heading home on the bus one day. And I, uh, I was like, why don't, we, why don't we get some, like, beers? You know, and uh, so we did, and we drank in this field, much like this one. Um, and uh, I didn't set out to get drunk. And it wasn't like, oh man, I'm gonna get so, you know, drunk. It was just like I'm gonna hang out with these people, and that's it. So I had a wine cooler, and you know, like girls drink, you know, like wine coolers and Coors Light stolen from their dad's basement, and um, and that's what we drank, you know. And what's interesting to me is that is that I, so I drank, and then I got this effect, where I had, like, these couple beers, and I started to loosen up, and, like, that feeling of anxiety went away, and the, the fact that I was terrified of all of you, that went away, too, and also, I had this thing in my brain, um, where it would be, like, if all of you started screaming at me, that's what it was like to be in my head, way before I drank, like, I mean, just literally screaming at me ideas about what I need to do, and what are people thinking about, all that stuff. Um, and you, you all shut up. It turned off. And it was just like, I could breathe. And, um, and that was, that was, that was the power that, that alcohol had over me. And that would be great. If I could just have one or two or three or four, get that effect, those voices shut off and it's all good. The problem is, is that I overshoot the mark every time. I overshoot that mark and then I'm throwing up all in front of myself and everybody's mad at me. You know? And, um, and so, you know, when alcohol adjusts your perception, you know, like that, like, no wonder I drink, you know? Um, I need something like that in order to exist. And I was a really suicidal kid till I found alcohol, you know? Um, so I'm drinking with these girls, and there were girls on this team that I was on that I didn't like, or that, like, I never really bonded with, because like I said, I had issues with that. Um, 
And uh, and I remember this one girl in particular, I did not like her, but I needed to get to the bathroom, and I couldn't seem to make it there on my own. And I remember just throwing my arm around her and just being like, why don't we hang out more, you know? And she was awful. And But, like, because alcohol just makes me feel alive and open, I just want to be everybody's best friend and um, and everybody's great. And, uh, you know, and I can't make it to the bathroom, but I feel awesome. Um, so, you know, they tried to put me to sleep. I was the only one that got cut off that night. They tried to put me in a tent to go to sleep, and I just, I literally, I couldn't walk at this point. I'm so hammered. And I'm, like, army crawling out of the tent to go hang out. That's how desperate I was to be around you guys now, you know, where I would have army crawled away from you when I was sober. It was, like, unbelievable what alcohol did to me. And I remember sort of wandering off away from everyone because I was sick and I wasn't sure if I was going to throw up. And uh, I, I was laying on the ground looking up at the stars and the world is spinning and you get the spins and um, and I'm feeling a little sick. But man, like, I just, I just remember thinking this is how I want to feel the rest of my life. You know, this is it. Um, you know, and I didn't, I didn't start, you know, capping on Kensington Ave, like, right after that, but, um, but I saved that memory, and, you know, within about a year, I was drinking on a daily basis, because really, what was the point (laughs) of going through life feeling sober, you know? Um, it was awful. Uh, so, let's see, I went off to, to college, um, and, uh, you know, drinking, drinking on the weekends, going to college parties college party uh one party there was just one i exaggerated there was just one i was invited to um yeah i know aw uh, yeah i'm invited to all the parties now um <laughs> no i you know so oh yeah so i went to this college party and like i went there and i'm doing all these shots like i felt a lot i'm telling you guys like it transformed me i was this shy simply weird gross braces, everything. It was not a pretty picture. And, um, you know, I was the sexiest girl at that party that day. I was a sophomore. I was at this college party. And I was like, these guys want to fuck me, you know? And uh, I was like, I would do them for one minute. And that's what I'm thinking. It's like, I'm the funniest. I'm the sexiest. I am like, just everybody wants to know me, you know? And had I not had alcohol, I would have been hiding in the bathroom, just like, oh God, how do I get out of here? You know? Um, but there I am doing quarters with these guys, and here's perception for you. So doing quarters. Now, when you play quarters, I don't know if you miss and you drink or when you get it in. You dr- I'm not sure how it works because I just did shots as I was doing it. And um, and so within literally a half an hour of arriving here, I'm like, excuse me, gentlemen, you know, cool, as a cucumber, because I felt that saliva, you know. And you're like, oh, I know what that means. So I went outside, and I proceeded to vomit all over the front of myself. And uh, when you do that and you're very drunk, what tends to happen is that you do this. <laughs> that doesn't get it all out. It doesn't. So I did that, and I rolled right back in there. And, I, and I'm still the sexiest, funniest girl these guys have ever met, you know? And uh, I got those looks like, you should go to bed, you should go home, you know? And I didn't know why, why, you know? Why? And uh, it's like an animal. And and it wasn't until the next day I woke up and there was like dried this piece of corn and just crap all over there. I was just like, oh, that's why they wanted me out of there. Oh. Ha-ha. But um, <laughs> just a mess. So that's how I drank. So And that is why I drank alone, you know? Um, nobody wants to drink with that girl. Not even me. <laughs> um... So what happened? I I had a, a panic attack my senior year in high school. I switched high schools because that was just I mean, too much. People, you know, it's funny. Um, I decided to switch high schools after being and growing up with these these people for for 12 years since kindergarten. And I switched high schools because I thought no one liked me. That's what I thought. And and I have a letter to this day that my friends gave to my mom um, with all of them signed it and said, "We don't want you to go. Why are you leaving?" And in my head, I'm like, they don't mean it, you know. Um, so alcohol stopped, stopped really doing something awesome for me. There started to be too much pain, you know. I don't know if that makes sense. Um, so, so I started drinking every day. I switched schools, and I had a half hour drive to this new school. And um, oh, and yeah, and I had a panic attack, stone cold sober. Um, and they were like, Emily, are you drunk? I'm like, no, that's the problem. 
problem, you know. Um, that's why I had to be sent to the hospital. And a year later, I'm in uh, Temple University Hospital, um, absolutely drunk, out of my mind. I drank, I think, like a fifth of rum uh, by maybe noon. And um, alone in my room, <laughs> my, my college roommate would come in and just see me sitting alone watching, like, Jerry Springer just doing shots. So excited that I found something that I can drink straight. And uh, and she would walk in after, like, her 840 class, and I'd be sitting on my bed just doing shots, and she'd be like, are you okay? I'm like, yes. Do you know that I can drink this straight? Isn't that awesome? She's like, do you think you have a problem? Like, two weeks into the semester, do you think you have a problem? Um, I was like, no, this is this is not a problem. This is great news, you know? Uh so, you know, that that was me. And, and within a month, I was in arm and leg restraints at Temple University Hospital, uh, completely out of my mind drunk. Something happened in that year where being sober, that, that first time I landed up in the hospital because sobriety is like that screaming and that thing that's in my gut that doesn't feel right is there. And then all of a sudden, a year later, I've got so much in me, that, but that's still there, you know, and it's not it's not fixing it anymore. Um so uh, so I end up in the hospital, and, and this is the rounds of psychiatrists and psychologists, therapists, moving and all this stuff to try to fix what's wrong with me, you know, and nothing glamorous, just hospitals and doctors saying, Emily, we don't know what's wrong with you, so we're just going to throw all these pills at you and hope something works. Um, and nothing quite did the trick the way that alcohol did, because really by the end I was just drinking to be a vegetable, and they wouldn't give me anything to just numb me out until I died, you know. That's what I wanted. Um, so I ended up... Um, yeah, moving a few times and just kind of just getting worse and worse. And uh, I remember leaving. I moved down with my mom because I thought that would fix it. I can't do this stuff with my mom around, and I did. And um, I remember leaving to move back up to Philadelphia that day and her just sobbing, not because she was going to miss me, because she was terrified of, like, what was going to happen to me. Um, so I come back to Philly and I decide I'm just going to drink on the weekends and do my schoolwork during the week, you know, because everybody's telling me, Emily, you just got to pull it together. You just got to pull it together. I'm like, take your meds, you got to pull it together. And, um, and I could not for the life of me pull it together. And at this point, I'm just trying to get okay. I'm doing everything that I possibly can to just be okay, to function in society. Um, and, uh, I go back to school and I'm like, okay partying on the weekends and I have this whole plan and within a week that falls apart because I don't know if I start drinking on Saturday I might not stop till Wednesday I don't know um because that's just the way I drink I don't stop until it's out or I'm passed out um you know so I don't have control over that um and I tried really hard to and um because mm-hmm. I just wanted to be that girl I could just party have a good time go to school be normal and uh and it didn't work so I, I come home one day, I'm out of money, I'm out of booze, um, uh, you know, just in a hurting, and I'm sobbing, and it's one of the days that I went to school, and I'm coming home, and I know that there's nothing left, and that's a terrifying feeling when you don't know how you're going to get the next drink. I was terrified, um, because I was pretty much messed up around the clock at this point. Um, so... Just drinking to be a vegetable until I got the, the guts to kill myself. That was it. That was my plan. Um, so I'm coming home one day sobbing, and I, I call this girl. I don't know if it was for sympathy or whatever, uh, money. I don't really know. And and I call her, and I get gut-level honest, and I had no idea that that's what I was going to do. Um, but I called her, and I said, you know, Amanda, I can't stop drinking, and I want to die. Um, and uh, And she said... And I'm, I'm like, I'm literally, I'm sobbing. There's nothing at home. I'm like, I don't know how I'm going to feel okay. And I want to die. And like, and I say that to her and she's like, well, Emily, why don't you come to an AA meeting with me? She started dating this guy in the program. And I was like, eh. she said, Emily, why don't you come to an AA meeting with me? And, uh, and I was like, no, nah. that was too much. I was like, that's an overreaction, you know? I can't stop drinking and I want to die. Let's focus on the I want to die part first, you know? I didn't want to stop drinking. I didn't want to. Even in my first meeting, probably my first month sober, I didn't want to stop drinking. I didn't want to. Um, and I didn't, I, I don't know, maybe I didn't even need to. I don't know. I just came and I was too stupid to not do the steps. Really. <laughs> like, that was it. And it worked on me, you know? So that's why I, I that, Say it's like, you know, it's not for people that need it, it's for people that want it. I didn't even want it, but it worked anyway. 
Um, uh, so, so yeah, so, you know, so she was like, okay, why don't you come to an AA meeting with me? And I said no, and she said to me, what I could not argue with was, Emily, what do you have to lose? Oh, nothing, you know, nothing. I was living in a step above a crack house. I was um, living in the worst neighborhood. Literally, the, the day I moved in there, they're like, yo, yo, we got what you need. You want that wet, you know? That, that's perfect strangers. I was like, this is my fantasy land, you know? Um, but, uh, but, yeah, so, you know, I, I had no relationship with my parents or friends um, unless I was asking them for money or doing drugs with them or drinking with them. Um, you know, so what do you have to lose? And that stopped me dead in my tracks. Nothing. Um, so I go to this meeting with her. She, she has me meet her right away because she knows that window's small, you know. She's like, call me me right now. So I do. I drop my stuff off at my house. And there's still a bottle, empty bottle of vodka, uh, White Tavern vodka. It was seven bucks um, for a fifth. And, uh, you know, you know it's interesting. I never had money. I never had ten dollars. I had, I had a fifth of vodka and, like, a pint, you know. I had, uh, I never had money. It automatically was translated in my head what I could buy with it, you know. Um. So I came home, or yeah, I came home, dropped myself off, went and met this girl, and she had me read a, a story out of the back of the big book and that she thought I would relate to, and I tried to read it, but my brain is starting to act up again, and um, and I'm sober for the first time in a long time, and uh, and I can't focus on anything. I was a, an English major at Temple University, and, and I couldn't read. That's how loud my head was. I could not comprehend anything. Um, so I got to the end, and she was like, well, did you relate? And I knew what the answer should be, so I was like, yeah, you know, it was good. It was a really good story, you know, and I had no idea what I had read, something about some girl in college, not, that's me, you know. Um, so we go to this meeting, and I'm sitting in there, and I remember being so anxious that I had these, these nail marks in my palms um, because I was squeezing my hands together so tight because I was just this nerve. And uh, and I sat in there, and there it um, Foggy, voices are back, anxious, people are trying to talk to me, which was awful. Um, and, uh, you know, I sat in that meeting, and thank God, I was, like, relieved no one was trying to talk to me anymore, and I was relating. People were sharing, and I was tuning in and out because I was so foggy, but every now and then I would tune in, and people were talking about how they thought, how they felt, and how they drank. And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I had all these diagnoses on me, and people were talking about themselves, themselves and I was like, that's me, that's it. You know, and uh, and it sank in. That was really that was really a, a powerful experience. I was like, oh my god, I belong here. You know, these people are messed up, <laughs> and um and you are all of you. Uh, so uh, yeah, so I sat in a meeting, and then they were like, go get your 24 hour chip. You should go get your 24 hour chip, Emily. I was like, I don't have 24 hours, <laughs> and then trying to be really, you know, trying to find a way out of it, and um. No, no, it's just if you, like, have a desire. I was like, I'm not going up there to get a chip. You know? That was, like, the worst thing to do to a newcomer, in my opinion. It's like, you are claiming, like, this deadly disease that 50% chance will kill you or make you uh, spiritually dead. And and we're going to parade you in front of every one of these people in here so you can get your chip. <laughs> you know? And it's like, yay, I'm dying. Thanks. You know? Ah. So I actually never make my sponsees go get their 24 hours, never. I'm just like, this is fine, you know. Um, we'll get it later. So anyway, so I um, I sit in that meeting and I related, and then the next day I got tricked into going to my next meeting because um, I was like, I just went to one yesterday. And they're like, well, what are you doing? Nothing, you know. I know. I wish that for people that get in here. It's like don't have a social calendar, you know, um, because uh, you, you might be missing out. But I had nothing going on, and uh, – and I went to this other meeting that I got tricked into, and there was a big book study, and Sarah Bear was there, and um, her name is Sarah Bear. Aww. She was there, and uh, a couple of her sponsees, and um, they are like, Emily, do you have a sponsor yet? Do you have a sponsor yet? Do you have a sponsor? And I had no idea what a sponsor was, and uh, so I'm, like, scoping out the meeting, and I'm trying to figure out, because they're like, pick somebody who has what you want. Like, okay. So I'm looking around the room, and I'm shaky, and they're not talking to me. And uh, and I hate every second of it. And I had this stupid big book meeting in this church, in this cafeteria. And I hate it. And, uh, and I'm looking around for this stupid person that has what I want. <laughs> and uh, and then I see her. And uh, she had short hair, like shaved head, and a pink poof. It was a pink poof, top of her head. She had these big earrings, 
and uh, she had an accent, you know, and um, and she uh, she said HP instead of God, which was a huge bonus because I was not doing the God thing because um, God people were awful and they hated me, um, that's for sure. And uh, so I zoned in on her and oh, and I thought she might be a lesbian because of the hair, it was like shaved, so automatically if you had short hair as a woman, I was like, you're gay, you know, uh, and that's not true, um, <laughs> so, so I was like, yeah, okay, so, you know, if the whole sponsorship thing doesn't work out, you know, so she had what I wanted, you know, um, so I was like, all right, so I decided to ask her, and, um, and she and I went up to her, I was like, will you be my sponsor, and, uh, and she said, no. <laughs> It was awful. And um, she was like, no, but I have, because I'm leaving for Australia tomorrow for a month. So here's this woman. I sponsor her, and she's great. And there's this woman. I was like, oh, she's not gay, you know? Um, I really, I did. I lost interest after that. But I, uh, I, I got her number, and you know what was cool? They didn't send me off with just the number. They sat down with me outside of this coffee shop for hours, and they talked to me, to me about alcoholism. This girl that they had just met. They took hours out of their awesome, full lives to sit down with this pathetic uh, excuse for a human being, really. Um, and uh, they explained to me about alcoholism, and I remember it so clearly, like Sarah and me sitting on this bench, and I'm looking at my shoes that weren't mine, and um, and her just talking about alcoholism, alcoholism and the bedevilment and all that stuff. And, uh, you know, it was I don't honestly remember exactly what was said, but I remember relating, 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 and then they're like, so you think you're an alcoholic? I'm like, nah. You know, and uh, and they're like, all right, you know what? We've told you everything we know about alcoholism, Emily. Why don't you go out and try some controlled drinking? Like, go to the bar, you know. And I was like, well, this is an experiment. I can't, I can't drink at bars. I'm not of age yet. And they're like, well, where do you drink? At my house. Oh, okay. So the experiment is to find out whether or not you're an alcoholic. Go to your house and have like, you know, you hang out with your friends, whatever you do. And I was like, well. I don't really drink with my friends. And they're like, so you drink at home alone in your room? I was like, yep. And they're like, so the experiment to find out whether or not you're an alcoholic, go home to your room alone where you usually drink, have one or two, and then stop and see what happens. I'll try that a couple times. And, um, and just the thought of doing that, shot terror down my spine because I knew I never was going to drink like that. I never drank like that. I was never going to drink like that. And then just the thought of drinking like that made me angry, <laughs> you know? Um, so I knew then, and you know, there's a part in the book where it talks about how the idea that I can drink like another person has to be smashed. I remember that moment and that has not left me to this day. Thank God that they didn't sugarcoat this. They're like, well, keep coming back. See if you hear your story. They're like, you don't think you're an alcoholic. You've related on all these points go see, you know, and, um, and I think that was, that was very bold of them to do, but it worked out in my case, because I remember that moment so vividly, nothing else about the rest of that night, and, um, except for the fact that I knew that I was an alcoholic, and that hasn't left me in six years, you know, um, so, so there I was, I was an alcoholic, and they didn't paint, they didn't paint a pretty picture about it, you know, and I never do with my sponsees, like, you're doomed if you're an alcoholic, you know, and it's, it's torture to say that to somebody if you don't have a solution to follow it up, to back it up, you know. Um, so they said, you are doomed, and you can try this. This has worked for us, you know. And I believe them because they told me their stories, and, and I, I knew that they got what I, what I had on the inside. And um, so I, uh, I have this sponsor now, and I go home, and I have a little bit of hope in my heart um, because I think, all right, well, maybe this will work, you know. I'm still not all about the God thing. That's weird, and I hate that. Um, but I went home, and I had a little hope in my heart. I took a shower for the first time in probably a week because um, I was alone a lot, so why shower? And um, <laughs> and uh, so I take a shower, and I'm feeling all right, and then I, and I come out, and I hear my, my some guy that I can get stuff from very easily, his voice coming down the hall. And uh, I remember, I lived in a place that you could get anything, anytime, any day. Um, so I come out, and I run into my room, and I lock the door, and I'm like, oh, and that thing, and that feeling. And um, I call this guy who I had met in AA, 
And I'm like, hey, there's this guy, and I know I, I just want one. And, uh, and I called him to get permission. He was like, well, you have sponsor tonight, right? I was like, yeah. He's like, call her. Click. <laughs> I just met her, you know? I couldn't call her, and um, but I did. And uh, I called her to get permission. I was like, I was like, listen, I just need one. We'll get started on the step stuff tomorrow. And um, and so I called to get permission, and I explained to her, like, listen, you know, I'm an alcoholic. You're an alcoholic. I just need one. It's not a big deal. And uh, you know, I'm crying, and it's like this big emotional scene because really, like, the the obsession was on me. I, I knew, I knew what I needed. You know, I knew what I needed to feel okay, and um, I thought I did. And so I, I'm explaining this to her, and she's like, well, Emily, I can't, you can do what you want. I don't, I can't stop you. I was like, you're my ace, mother. You have to be able to do something, you know. And she was like, well, what I do in this, in your situation is I pray. One of those, you know. Excuse, you know. I don't need a prayer. I need a Xanax, you know. Um, so, you know, and I, I said that to her. I was like, I don't need to pray. You're a Christian weirdo, and you hate me. Like, no. And, um. And I was like, I don't need prayer. I need Xanax. She was like, think of it as a spiritual Xanax. I swear to God, I might not have prayed had she not said that. And I was like, it'll do that, you know? Um, so, and you know, and I still put up a fight, and I was like, this is stupid, and blah, blah, blah. And really, the, the last, you know, sort of nail in the coffin was, well, Emily, you know what? What do you have to lose? So um, so we opened the book to page 63 in my fresh new book, and we said the third step prayer together, and I'm sobbing, and I don't think it's going to work, and it's really crazy, and, um, and I say this prayer with her, and, uh, and I felt better at the end of it. Nothing crazy happened. I just felt better. And I said, Patty, can we say that again? And um, I went into it kicking and screaming, and, uh, and I felt better, and I knew... I just knew that I was going to be okay that night. I didn't know about any other night what in the future. I just knew I was okay that night. And even after that, I had problems with the whole God thing. But you know what happened for me was, um, I know a lot of people struggle with that. Uh, what happened for me was that I kept having experiences where I couldn't help but believe in God. I couldn't help it. Um, and I wish that for you if you're struggling with that. Like, take the actions, you know. That was one of the things. Just take the actions. See what happens. Try an experiment. What do you have to lose? You know, and and uh, and that that's exactly what happened for me, man. Like I showed up, I did stuff I didn't necessarily believe in, and you know what's funny is like the stuff that's the best for me, <laughs> the stuff that's the best for me, um, is the stuff that I go kicking and screaming into the most. You know, it it always works like that. Like to this day, I hate gratitude lists and I hate amends. You know, hate them, hate them. Only time my sponsor will hang up on me is, I can't do this. I can't do this amends. I can't. And uh, she'll hang up on me. And um, and then I'll do it, and I'll feel amazing. And my relationship to the world is right again, you know? Go figure. Um, so I go kicking and screaming into the steps. And, and re- I swear, like, I was just, I was so burnt out. My brain was just so foggy, and I was so miserable that I was just willing to do what these people said. Emily, we're taking this meeting to this Christian recovery house. You're coming. you got to drive us. Okay. You know? And uh, just showing up. We're going to this meeting tomorrow. We're going to get dinner, and then the, what are you doing? Uh, no, I have um, nothing, you know? And, uh, and I would just go, and I would follow these people around like a sick puppy. And I remember... Just sitting and eating with people and not having friends like the first year because I couldn't relate. Like I just had people in my life that were teachers. That was it. Because all I could do to hold a conversation was to a- just ask questions. Because all like, well, what does this mean in the book when it says this? You know. And we would just be in the middle of eating. <laughs> and um, I just had no clue, no clue. So I'm going through the steps and I made some amends and we went over, you know, prayer meditation and um, and they're like, okay, Emily, you gotta go help people now. Take them through the book. I had like a month sober. And I was like, I'm crazy. I can't do anything. Are you kidding? Like, I was doing this thing where I would switch words mid-sentence and then I would just walk away because my head was so far beyond what I was trying to say and it was loud. And like, so I would just be like, and then, and I would walk away, you know? 
because it was just so dumb and crazy. And um, and so they were like, okay, you gotta, you know, help people now. I was like, ah, oh, I can't. And they're like, okay, well, you can help people or you can die. You know? And they were like, just set things, and they were totally tricking me. I was, you know, like, I wasn't gonna die that second, but that's what it felt like, because they were, you know, persuasive. And I was dumb. And so I would just say, okay, you know, I'll help people then. And so I, I remember I, I grabbed this girl after this meeting, and I sat down, opened the book, and shared my experience. And, you know, what they, they made me feel so useful and with such a purpose, you know. And I remember them saying, Emily, you know, they're going to relate to you a lot quicker than us because I have ten years. She has five years. Like, you have three months. Who's she going to listen to first, you know? And I was like, I just, for the first time, instead of feeling like a burden, instead of feeling like I was sucking the life out of the people around me, I felt like I was useful. I was like, oh, what an amazing gift to give to an alcoholic. Because we do. We suck the life out of people. That's not a judgment. We do that. Um, you know, so to, to actually be able to give back and to contribute to the universe and feel like I had a special place right here on Earth, best thing. Um, so I did that. I started sponsoring people and showing up and, you know, doing all that stuff and uh, got fired up about it and... Um, about two years sober, I, uh, decided that I didn't really need to sponsor, <laughs> um, because I was helping people, and that was good enough, and, um, I was very spiritual, and even though, like, I didn't really pray or meditate, um, so I'm kind of running on self-will, and I end up acting this spring and summer, and for the first time I had friends, so, God no, like, I didn't really owe that many amends, because I didn't know that many people, the worst amends I've had to make are the ones that, for the damage I've done in sobriety. Because I had no excuse. I was just a jerk, you know. Um, so I did this, like, spring and summer thing where I was sponsoring myself. And, you know, I ended up hurting people really, really badly. Really badly. Destroying people's reputations. Lying. Destroying friendships. Um, you know, and eventually I, I got to the point where I wanted to drink. And uh, I couldn't... I. Couldn't decide, actually, no, I could, I wanted to die, and I couldn't decide whether I should just go down to AC, fill up a shopping cart filled with booze, and just drink myself to death in a hotel room, uh, or just quickly, if I could just get the, the courage to kill myself. That's where I was about two years sober. And I went to this meeting, and, um, there was a woman there, and I was, I was telling one of the guys, like, maybe I'll ask her to, like, give me, like, take me through the steps again. Like, maybe I just need to tune up, you know? Because I couldn't tell people, I couldn't tell people I was dying, because everybody else was fine. Everybody else is helping people, and they were great, and there was nothing wrong with them. There can't be anything wrong with me. And I certainly can't tell them the awful things that I've been doing on on the sly, you know. And uh, and so I asked this woman. Actually, I was pushed towards her, like I always was with stuff like that. And uh, I was pushed, and, uh, and I was like, will you sponsor me? I just need step stuff, you know. And uh, she was like, okay, read the doctor's thing, yada, yada, yada. And, and she calls me for the first time. She calls me back, and... And she says, how are you? And I said, I want to die. I want to die. Two years sober, I wanted out. Um, and she was like, okay. And then I called her once freaking out. She was like, write down all your secrets and fears and call me back. And I was like, I don't have secrets. I don't have secrets. Oh, man, I started writing. I was like, no wonder I want to die, you know. And I remember having the conscious thought when I was doing the messed up stuff that I was doing um, that I was not going to tell anybody about this. And then I had another thought. It was like, you're going to regret that. And I was like, no, I'm not. And I did it, and um, and it was awful. It almost took me back out, you know. But I, I would never give up that experience because I know so many people who have done it, and I get to share my experience with them and, and the stuff that I was doing and and what I did to get out of it, you know. And that's been, I, I got to tell you, probably equally as beneficial being honest about that and and sort of being sponsorless in sobriety and uh, and hitting an emotional bottom in sobriety. That's been just as useful as the, as the bottom I hit with alcohol, you know. Um, so. You know, I got back on track, and I dove in, and I became so effective because I, I had this compassion back, and I had this new understanding of what it meant to be powerless, and my life was unmanageable. I knew in my core, you know, and I was willing to do things before that, that I just wasn't willing to do. I was willing to not play on my phone during a meeting, you know. I was willing to, to show up early and set up chairs, be a part of a home group, get commitments. I didn't really want to do that stuff before. I wanted to do it when it was convenient, you know, and my sponsor was like, it's not service if it's convenient, you know. She's like, you're just hanging out, you know? So um, so I did. I started showing up and, and doing this stuff, and 
I felt so in the middle again, and, you know, it was so great because I, I had a real working relationship with a sponsor over here, and I was helping other girls over here, and I was right in the middle, you know, um, and it was a beautiful thing, and, and so many, I could stand up here all night, I won't do that, um, but I could stand up here all night and tell you about the amazing things going on in my life right now, and it has, you know, it's great materially, um, but on the inside, you know, again, about that purpose. And that heart that's no longer closed off, you know, that can't feel compassion, that can't feel love. Um, that's not true today. And uh, I don't know, I have this, this amazing capacity and I keep growing. And, you know, sometimes I just look over my shoulder and I'm just like, oh, my God, how did I get here? <laughs> you know, it, it really just keeps getting better. And I remember talking to old timers and being like, this is great. And they're like, it gets better. I'm like, what? You know, and, uh, and it really does. It really does. When you, you know, when you put in the effort, it's just like it's just these amazing things happen around you. And, you know, I need that. I need these God moments. I need these experiences that just further and deepen and strengthen my relationship with God. Because without that, I don't believe. I don't care what's happened in the past. If I'm not having a current experience now, like, forget it. I'll forget that, you know. And I'll get sick and I'll start mistreating you. And it's like that. So fast. Um, you know, so I, I don't know, I just have these amazing experiences and, you know, they keep happening and, uh, these little charges to the heart, you know, it's like my heart was dead and, you know, those paddles they use and then I get those all the time and that's awesome. Um, and that's like, that's my life today and it's full of peace and I don't know, I have prayer and meditation. I've gotten really, really serious about that. I slacked on that and for the pa- about the past year, um, especially I think I've been very focused on taking that time in the morning and at night lately it's been just in the morning um, but I extended it because I couldn't do it at night for whatever reason I was blocked and uh, so I just extended it in the morning and um, and it's been amazing you know and I, I had been praying for, for my grandma for a solid six months every single morning so when my mom called and told me that uh, she had died before I got there I didn't feel like I needed to say goodbye I already felt that connection you know um and it was amazing, and, like, I just, I, felt, I did not feel far away at all, and I don't know how else to describe it. Um, I felt like I was right there with her, telling her I loved her, you know. Um, and those are the experiences that I get to have as a result of showing up here, really just showing up, having absolutely no idea what was going on, and doing some things that I didn't believe in, because I had nothing left to lose, you know. So, that's all I have Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.